Hola, ¿cómo están? Soy Laura Sofi, directora del Museo del Origami en Colonia del Sacramento, Uruguay. Hoy está con nosotros Thomas Hull, profesor asociado de matemáticas de la Western New England University de los Estados Unidos. Tom es un profesor extraordinariamente creativo y divertido, que usa el plegado del papel en sus cursos universitarios avanzados. Es también autor de numerosos papers científicos y de libros para enseñar matemáticas y geometría con origami en la escuela secundaria y la universidad. También es famoso por diseñar modelos de origami complejos y muy bellos. Los invito a conocer a Thomas Hull. Hello, my name is Tom Hall, and I'm an origami artist as well as an origami mathematician. Let me try to explain what that means. I've been doing origami since I was eight years old. I started designing my own origami models when I was in high school and college. Um, at first I made masks like this one here. This is, I call this the Elf King mask, and it's made out of foil, foil paper, foil back paper. But this is a very old model. I made this uh, a long time ago, okay. Um, but then I turned to making geometric designs, like like some, things like this. This is folded out of one piece of paper. Um, it's uh, got lots of pleats, as you can see, and it, it folds flat, which is kind of nice. So this is uh, an abstract model, but still something you can fold out of paper. But there are two origami designs that I discovered that are the most well-known. Uh, the first one I want to show you is called the Fizz Unit. Um, it is an example of modular origami. Modular origami is where you fold lots of pieces of paper in the same way, like these. These are the Fizz Units. Okay? And then you, but you, all the pieces of paper are folded exactly like this, lots of them, and then you lock them together without glue. So I will demonstrate that by locking these together. You slide them. They all have pockets and, and tabs you can put the pockets into. And so I'll do that here. Um, but you lock them together to make interesting structures, or pretty structures. So these three go together to make this, uh, this little triangle, little pyramid. And then you can add more and more and more of them together to make larger objects, like this. This is made of 30 of those units that I just showed you. And it makes a structure called a dodecahedron. Yes. And you can make bigger things, too. Uh, in fact, I have one of them right here, this thing. Uh, this is made out of uh, over a hundred units, uh, fizz units, okay? And, um, and this, so you can make bigger and bigger things, but, uh, but it's called the fizz unit, and the re that's P-H-I-Z-Z, -Z, and the reason why it's called that is it stands for Pentagon Hexagon Zigzag Unit. It's because uh, the unit, it very easily makes these pentagon holes that are black, these pentagon holes, and around it are hexagon holes all around it. Okay, so pentagon and hexagon holes are, are, are what the unit naturally wants to make, and you can make bigger, big buckyball structures is what they're called out of, out of those things. Okay, um, the other famous model that I discovered is called five intersecting tetrahedra. Uh, so it is what you get when you take a modular pyramid, or a tetrahedron as it's called in the business, like this. This is uh, out of six rectangles of paper, each color here is a different piece of paper, okay? But imagine I made a lot of these and wove them together in some kind of symmetric way so that they all locked together. How could you do that? And how many pyramids or tetrahedra would you need? Well, it turns out there's a very nice way to do it with five of them. So if I made these, except I made each tetrahedron all the same color and put them all together, I'd get this. Yeah, this is this is the five intersecting tetrahedra model. Um, it is. It takes 30 pieces of paper or five of those tetrahedra um, and this is what it looks like if each tetrahedron is uh, a different color, all, but each tetrahedron is all one color. What I like about this is that you can explore modular models like this in many different ways. You can, you can make them and just admire them, but you can also play with the colors. So this is the same five intersecting tetrahedra model, but now the tetrahedra are not all the same color. They're different colors, but they're still arranged mathematically. This is one of the things I really like about modular origami. Um, you can explore the different ways to color just from a purely artistic point of view, but you can also explore it using mathematics. And that's what I do in my career. I'm a mathematics professor. I teach college level math at Western New England University, uh, located in Springfield, Massachusetts in the USA. Um, 
I teach courses like calculus, linear algebra, high level geometry, discrete math and real analysis and other courses too. Um, but professors don't just teach, they also do research. Uh, uh, and every professor has an area of expertise that they do research in. My area of expertise is origami, really. <laughs> I study the math behind origami. Um, see, origami follows certain rules. The paper is not allowed to, to uh, rip or stretch, you know, um, and those are constraints that impose rules on anything you fold. I and other people who are interested in the mathematics of origami want to know, want, we want to understand those rules. So we use math to prove theorems about origami. Um, for example, one question that I've looked at is, is the, the following. G given an origami crease pattern, okay, like this, all right, this is a, a well-known crease pattern. Um, it folds into an origami crane. Here, let me show you. you. You fold this up and get the head and the tail like that. So all those crease lines that you saw just a moment ago were used to fold this up, okay? Um, now, uh, the math question that I'm interested in is how many different ways can I fold that crease pattern? For example, this is one way, but I could also unfold the tail and fold the tail up like this. That's a different way to fold it. Or I could fold the tail in back. So that's another different way. Um, so the classic way of folding the crane is like this, but this crease pattern is pretty complicated. There are probably many different ways you could have these creases all come together, all be folded, okay? Um, so the thing is, no one knows the full answer to this question. We, we know part of the answer, like counting how many ways I can fold these crease lines up for a given crease pattern. Um, in some cases, we can count them, but not all cases. So no one knows the full answer. We, we, we don't have a specific formula or algorithm for handling every single case. Not yet. This is something that I've been working on with my students, and we've made a lot of progress. Okay. Um, now, being, I think being an origami math professor is very exciting. I get to share origami math problems with my students. I get to work with um, researchers, other researchers in engineering, physics, architecture, and computer science from around the world who are all interested in the mathematics of origami. Because many origami models um, make interesting structures that can fold and unfold nicely, um, they make nice what are things that are called origami mechanisms. This is just another example. This is something called a square twist, and it makes the paper fold and unfold in a rather interesting way. You know, um, like notice the center square is twisting and stuff. So you can imagine mechanisms like this being kind of chained together to maybe make an origami robot of some kind. Um, that's why people in robotics, robotics engineering, are actually very interested in origami. Partly because, hey, if you could actually build an origami robot, something that moved like this, um, then it's folded out of a flat sheet of material. It might not be paper, it might be metal or something, but, but if it's flat, that means it's easily, easy to manufacture. You know, you don't have to worry about all sorts of parts coming together in 3D. You just make this out of some flat and then fold it up. Boom, you know. Also, origami mechanisms are, they have a special property called scale independence or independence of scale. And that means that I, if I used stiff enough material, I could make this mechanism right here out of a big sheet of material. You know, like something really big, like metal and maybe hinges for the crease lines, you know. Or, and, and if I did, it, it would move just like this, if I, could, if I could actually get it to fold. Or I could, I could make this out of something microscopic, something really, really tiny. If I found some tiny material and could give it this crease pattern, then it would have to fold exactly like this. So the way it moves is independent of scale. Um, let me show you another example that, that we actually did, some research friend uh, collaborators of mine um, also did. This is something called the octet truss that was invented by uh, several people, but like I've got David Huffman and Joshikazu Kawasaki and others. Um, it opens and closes in a really intricate way. Okay, so again, this is a flat piece of paper, no cuts, no, you know, but, but it opens and closes in this rather cool way. Um, so I was collaborating with some uh, uh, physicists in, in the polymer science lab at the University of Massachusetts, Ryan Hayward, Jing Na, Kristen Santangelo, and they had a way of folding really tiny microscopic materials, and they wanted something complicated to fold, so, so we did this, and they actually got it to work. This is... Uh, 
actually a photograph. This is an electron microscopy photograph of the same model I just told you, showed you this, this thing. Okay. And, uh, except this is less than a millimeter wide. This is super tiny and it can fold and unfold just like that thing I showed you. Okay. Uh, the fact that, and they, the fact that they could do this means that again, it demonstrates this, this scale independence, but also this is made out of something called a, a soft polymer gel. It's water-based. This is something you could inject into the human body and it, there would be no problems because it's basically made of water, okay, and some, and some chemicals. Uh, and this gets people very excited in, in an area of engineering called bioengineering because imagine you made, maybe not this, but something like this, an origami uh, gel thing that, you could, that could fold up maybe into a ball and maybe contain some really toxic cancer-fighting drug, okay? And then if you could inject that into the human body and have it program it to unfold when it encounters a cancer tumor cell, then that's called targeted drug delivery. And origami offers one way to try to do that. So that makes, again, like I said, bioengineers very excited, okay? Um, in fact, the research behind this, that this thing that I showed you, was funded by the National Science Foundation, Division of Engineering, in fact. Um, and my current research is also supported by the National Science Foundation, Division of Mathematical Sciences. Um, so it's not just me who thinks this is exciting. There is enough interest in origami research uh, for funding agencies and, and origami research applications for funding agencies like the National Science Foundation to want to support this work. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the mathematics of origami and its applications to science, um, there are a lot of resources you can find online. Uh, I've also written a book, uh, this book in fact, called Project Origami. It's about using um, origami to help teach math in college and high school classrooms. Yeah, really. Um, and this book has been translated into Japanese and Chinese, so, it, so it's out there. So that's one thing you can look at. I'm also writing a, another book um, on origami math that is going to be published by Cambridge University Press later this year, later in 2020. Okay. So it's been my pleasure to contribute this video to the Museum of Origami. Um, thank you for watching.